Cool. All right. Well, I think it's time for our last guest, certainly not least. Um, I'm going to pass it over to uh, Lindsay Pino right now from the University of Pennsylvania. So we can stop looking at my boring schedule slide and start looking at some actual DIA science. So go ahead and take it away, Lindsay. Cool. So just to check, are you seeing my slide screen? Or are you seeing my presenter view? Slide screen looks fine. Don't Perfect. <laughs> Every now and then, Zoom switches it up on me and it get, goes backwards. Um, so I really enjoyed the two talks today, um, kind of going over both the, the current state of what we're doing with data independent acquisition. Um, and I wanted to launch off of that maybe a discussion of some of the future things that we can think about doing um, with DIA quantification. Uh, and I'm going to present that in the context of doing uh, these these kind of dynamic spatio temporal proteomics. Um, so just really quick, I do have a couple disclosures. Um, I'm currently employed as a postdoc researcher at the University of Pennsylvania, but I have also co founded and I currently consult um, for a company called Talus Bioscience. So in this talk, as I mentioned, we're going to focus on some of these maybe future directions that we can think about uh, DIA quantifications pushing the field of mass spectrometry proteomics. So I'm going to start off uh, introducing uh, a concept that uh, I first proposed a couple of years ago um, based on doing quantifications uh, in the context of a reference material. Then we're going to talk uh, a little bit about some work on DIA for exploring protein turnover. I'll talk a little bit then about PTMs. Um, I saw uh, Christina's already got a couple of questions, so hopefully we can make that a bit more of a discussion rather than uh, a lecture. Uh, and I want to mention there's other aspects of spatiotemporal proteomics that don't currently have a lot of DIA applications, but I think could definitely be futures um, for DIA work. So let's start talking about um, this reference material because it's going to kind of be the foundation for the rest of the talk. So I'll start off just saying, and I think Sue has really uh, just, just demonstrated that really well, that mass spectrometry itself is not inherently quantitative. So as mass spectrometry proteomicists, um, we know that you can take a sample. And even if you have the exact same sample, biologically, replicates can have some differences, or even technically, um, replicates can have differences. And that might be because we have two different operators. If I have two technicians or two postdocs, um, or maybe even two PIs, prep the exact same sample, they think the exact same way, there's going to inherently be um, variation between those two samples. And then, of course, uh, as we know, especially in, in core environments um, or in, in labs where you might have multiple of the exact same instrument, um, a dirty instrument versus a clean instrument or, you know, the favorite instrument versus the one that maybe nobody ever signs up for because it's, it's a little bit uh, lower signal. All of these aspects can cause two samples to have a very different uh, perceived quantities when actually, truly, um, biologically, they had the same quantity. So what we're going to do in, in quantitative mass spectrometry proteomics is we're going to compare the two chromatograms. And we're going to say, oh, this chromatogram has, has twice the intensity as this other chromatogram, um, as Sue has shown us now. And ideally, that would be the case. Ideally, if I had one sample and I measured a particular signal, I hope that that signal uh, is related to the quantity of the peptide uh, that was present in the sample. If I measured a second uh, sample and the signal was three times lower, I would expect, I would hope that that quantity is also three times lower. But we know that's not the case. For example, we might have two instruments. So if I measured one sample that had a truly a high quantity and measured it on maybe my dirty uh, instrument or measured it on my instrument that doesn't perform quite as well as my workhorse favorite instrument, the signal of that sample could appear lower than the signal of a lower quantity sample that was acquired on my favorite instrument. And this is because those two signals off of those two instruments is not calibrated. So if we look at one chromatogram versus a second chromatogram, even though the bottom chromatogram comes hypothetically from a sample with more peptide quantity in it, because those two signals aren't calibrated, if I were to just compare their raw intensities, I would think that the chromatogram on the top corresponds to a higher quantity than the chromatogram on the bottom. 
So in quantitative proteomics, you have a lot of ways of trying to get around this. Uh, most commonly, people try to use internal standards where you order synthetic peptides, maybe winged synthetic peptides, or maybe if your lab has a lot of money, you can get into synthetic or purified proteins. You spike those into the sample, and then you can compare the endogenous peptide to the uh, labeled peptide and use that quantitative ratio um, for your studies. But we're doing DIA, that's absolutely not going to be possible um, if you're trying to measure every single peptide in a sample. You can't get synthetic peptides for everything. So instead, what we have been doing is using external standards. So you would have your, your experimental sample of interest, and then you would choose some kind of reference material and then compare those two chromatograms to each other uh, in order to make a quantitative uh, uh, difference um, call. So what would your reference material be? It really is whatever your experiment happens to be. So if you're working in cell culture, you would pick a particular yeast or bacteria or cell line to work as your reference. If you're in bio samples, you might need to purchase a pooled plasma or a pooled CSF. But alternatively, you could also just pick a diverged species. So if I'm working in yeast, maybe a diver diverged enough species could be bacteria, um, where the peptides uh, in the reference are different from the peptides that are, are in um, the experimental samples. Whatever it is, you just pick some reference, and that's what you're going to be reporting all of your quantifications uh, relative to. So that's kind of uh, an introduction to how we might approach quantification um, in some of these, these spaces where uh, DIA doesn't let you get stable isotope labeled standards. We don't need those stable isotope standards to perform good quantification. So other ways people do quantification, um, especially with DDA, is using SILAC, stable isotope labeling with amino acids and cell culture. So you would take sample A, <laughs> you would take sample B, <laughs> thanks for the uh, uh, laser pointer assist. Um, you would take uh, uh, sample A, you would grow it in light media, you take uh, sample B and grow it in heavy media. When you mix those two together, you could then compare internally within a single mass spectrometry run um, the relative intensities of the light to the heavy peptides. And of course, with DIA, we have more of this reference material approach where you'd have the two separate samples, um, but then you might have more variation between uh, instrument to instrument runs. So it becomes a very natural question, well, why don't you combine them? <laughs> do SILAC DIA. So there's some reasons that maybe you would not want to do this um, regarding uh, splitting the, the MS1 isotope uh, precursor peaks um, across different DIA windows. But what we did is we decided to just ask the question empirically, can you combine these? So we took a light proteome and we took a heavy proteome and we created different ratios um, of these two mixed together. So a 100% heavy sample, 10%, 1%, 0.1% heavy sample. We we're gonna compare the quantifications between the light and the heavy ratios. So this is showing that data. So we have those expected ratios shown on the vertical axis. And then on the horizontal axis, I'm just spreading out um, the different ratios by uh, the log two abundance um, of the heavy peptide. So when we look at these ratios, we would expect a measured ratio to fall along this solid horizontal line. And that's more or less what we see. We're measuring this with DDA and we see especially at these uh, uh, easier to measure ratios, um, such as the 70%, 50%, and 10%, um, that DDA is pretty accurately capturing the correct ratio um, in these samples. We see that uh, ratio measurements start to decay a little bit once we get down to these more difficult to measure, more extreme ratios, like the 1 and the 0.1% samples. When we measure the exact same samples by DIA, we see that's not the case at all. Um, so we get an extra order of magnitude um, in additional, more sensitive coverage of the extreme 1% ratio. So that's what I'm showing in these uh, uh, red boxes. Um, we get an additional one order of mag magnitude um, sensitivity in ratios, but we also get an increased dynamic range. And that's what I'm showing along the horizontal with that arrow. Um, the dynamic range with DIA um, is just a lot broader because with DDA, you're only picking those top 10 most abundant. And even if you're using match between runs, you're not as, a, you're not as uh, capable of digging quite as deep into those lower sensitivity, lower abundance peptides. 
So clearly it, it looks like with, with DIA, um, you can dig a lot deeper um, into these ratios that you typically see with a protein turnover experiment, with a pulse SILAC experiment. So we're sold on, on protein turnover being improved by DIA. And I wanted to talk a little bit next about um, how DIA might improve post-translational modifications. Um, so this is uh, some work uh, by another postdoc here um, in the UPenn lab, uh, Josh Beza. What he's done is he's taken um, all of the PTM uh, modification sites that have been uh, uh, detected over time. So clearly for a long time, um, it was very difficult to find new PTM sites um, on, on proteins. And then there's suddenly around uh, 2010, um, a huge jump uh, in the number of acetylation sites uh, that we knew about. And this is because now mass spectrometry is being applied to PTM discovery. And that's not just acetylation. What uh, Josh shows is it's the same for phosphorylation too. Um, once mass spectrometry is introduced uh, into the, the field of PTM discovery, uh, we get drastically uh, more, more modification sites discovered. So just kind of overlooking the field, there's a lot of different PTMs um, that we can imagine wanting to quantify. Of course, phospho is, is one of the top favorites, but um, things like acetylation, um, glycosylation um, is becoming very popular to study, simulation, um, ubiquitination are all extremely popular uh, PTMs to be studying these days. And in part, uh, these increased discoveries um, are because of you know, improvements in the sample preparation and just looking at different types of, of biological material and perturbations. Um, but when I look at the, the top end um, of this figure that Josh has made, I see it kind of starting to plateau. And part of me wonders, is that a true biological limit of the number of PTMs that exist? Or are we just kind of hitting the limit of what we can do with conventional measurement methods um, that tend to be DDA based? Maybe we could improve this plateau by using DIA-based uh, approaches. So one of the things that gets a little tricky when you're going to try to do DIA um, with PTMs um, is the idea of isobaric PTM. So P uh, a peptide uh, modification where that modification uh, might be on different residues within the same peptide. So this is something we think about a lot in my postdoc lab um, because we study histones. Um, so super, super modified, um, lots of isobaric peptide species. And <clears throat> what I'm showing you here is all of uh, the DIA precursor isolation windows on the vertical, and then those DIA windows separated by the average measured retention time. So I'm showing you just one slice, one cycle um, of a DIA isolation window scheme. And over time at this one particular uh, retention time that I've picked, we can see that in these windows, uh, for example, three precursors are observed in the 50 MZ window from 750 uh, to 800 MZ. Uh, we see one precursor in 550 to 600 MZ, um, three precursors in the next window down, and so forth. So when I expand that out and show you the full cycle, um, looking for histone PTMs in this particular DIA method, uh, one thing that you see is that there are a lot of uh, DIA windows, isolation windows, where we're co-fragmenting lots of isobaric species or species within that 50 MZ uh, range. This is not super ideal, right? An ideal DIA method, we want as few co-fragmented isomers as possible. We want a fast cycle time to get points across the peak. And we don't really want to waste instrument time um, on idle windows. So we don't want to have uh, really high ion injection times um, trying to collect uh, precursors that aren't there in the first place. So when we're thinking about optimizing this kind of method, uh, one of the approaches um, that uh, we, we advocate for is the idea of staggered windows. So then you get half the window size um, for the same cycle time on your uh, instrument. Um, and another thing that we can think of is, is decreasing the precursor range that we're measuring. So one thing, uh, if we decrease the precursor range, now we have less time that we have to spend acquiring data. If we decrease the window width, now we have more specific uh, windows. We have smaller window size, so we get more specific sampling of the MS1. 
And now when we start to look at some of these windows, we can see that be, with the smaller windows, we've split some of these co-fragmenting isomers into two separate windows. So now I have, instead of three different um, uh, uh, precursors being co-fragmented together, now I get one and two precursors uh, in two separate windows. You can see this happen a couple times uh, throughout this. Now I'm highlighting another where we have two precursors that we're able to separate into two different DIA windows. Now we're no longer co-fragmenting those precursors. And this is just to say that um, this is just one particular DIA method optimization for one specific assay, but you can easily imagine um, these kind of, of principles being applied to any other type um, of DIA that you're doing, because it really all depends on the sample preparation. So for example, Christina doing um, immunopeptidomics, uh, when you're, you're looking at some of those things, a lot of the peptide size might only be eight to nine amino acids long um, if you've got a good purification. So that might shift the kind of DIA scheme that you want to set up, because now you're looking for peptides within a more constrained uh, mass to charge, precursor mass to charge range. So there's some established uh, DIA MS workflows for P, uh, PTMs, especially um, the work but, uh, that Brian Searle has done in the past few years. Typically, these start with acquiring a DDA spectral library, and then you can use that DDA spectral library to search your DIA data. And then there's, you know, like these great algorithms uh, for, for localizing uh, site-specific PTM fragments um, to ensure that uh, when you have these positional isomers that you're quantifying just the, the correct one. But I wonder in the future, we can't do this right now, but in the future, can we replace uh, that DDA spectral library instead use predicted PTM spectra. So this is something um, Dr. Ford had mentioned earlier uh, using algorithms like PROSIT. So right now, currently, I don't think PROSIT can support PTMs um, like phosphorylation or acetylation, but you can easily imagine this being um, future work, like near future work that we no longer have to acquire these DDA spectral libraries, which requires just so much material and extra instrument time um, to get deeply fractured uh, spectral libraries. So a very uh, quick overview of, of some of the spaces in which DIA is starting to be applied and I think could be implied in the future. Um, but as summary points, DIA um, and mass spectrometry is not inherently quantitative, but we can perform really high quality quantification um, without getting stable isotope labels like other targeted approaches do. Using DIA increases accuracy. So if you're doing things like protein turnover with a pulse SILAC DIA, um, it's a really great application um, for this method approach, method and analysis approach. And then finally, uh, using DIA might uh, help us discover new PTMs because it's an unbiased sampling, especially of those isobaric post-translational modifications. So thank my lab um, and especially my funding. Um, and yeah, I think future applications for DIA um, if anybody wants to get working on things like protein-protein interactions or protein localization, I think these are great places for DIA to uh, expand in the future. So go ahead and I'd be happy to take any questions that you've got um, or even start a bit of a discussion on some of these things. Lindsay, I thank you very much. It was uh, It's great to see all the possibilities. I know you've already helped me with some DIA and SILAC data that we're just getting mm -hmm. started to look at. Uh, I'm really excited about that possibility. I, uh, I wanted to tell the attendees that when you showed your different schemes, we've been using 8MZ windows mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that seems to work well. We, we've done some evaluation but you could spend months trying every different combo and in the end, find something that works well. And the 8MZ windows for us uh, has been just fine. Yeah, and yeah. With what the instrument DSA is that on? The 8MZ? Pardon? What instrument is the that Lumos. on? It's the on Lumos. Lumos. Yeah. Part of it is because they're self-packed columns. I'm, I'm the one who packs the columns and it's the same packing material I've had since the late 1990s. <laughs> Uh, hey, they're probably it not. Works. <laughs> yeah, I'm not changing. They're they're not uh, packed as tight, perhaps, as some people. So my peaks aren't ultra sharp, 
but it uh, seems to give us excellent results. And the thing that I did want to also mention that I hadn't said is we're now exclusively using ProSIT uh, libraries for all of our analysis, but also in conjunction almost all the time with a chromatogram library. Oh, yeah. On a few cases, we will acquire samples uh, with two gas phase fractions uh, across for each sample. So it's two injections of each sample and then search a ProSIT. Uh, but that's not for routine. Regularly, we would always make a chromatogram library. But the ProSIT has just been phenomenal because we've got all kinds of different species. We ran some marmoset samples last week. Um, it worked just fine. As long as there's a FASTA database, then you can generate or have generated for you a ProSIT. And uh, it's just amazing. Yeah, and we're right. happy to um, generate ProSIT libraries for anyone that um, needs them. It's it's a pretty simple process, but if you send us a fast day and some parameters, um, we're happy to do it. Yeah, and all you need is a fast day. So as long as there's a good one for the species you're working with, it doesn't doesn't have to be human. It doesn't have to be mouse. It doesn't have to be Arabidopsis. I've made some some pretty some pretty obscure ones for Sue. So um, yeah, just, right. it, just as you know, if you're not studying a model organism and you still want to take advantage of of the benefits of pros that we can definitely um, make that happen. So it's been a really good service, I think, for um, yes. both for oh, us yes. and I, for people in the community. I think the results I, look awesome for everybody that I've um, at least gotten feedback about. So people seem to really like it. it it's, I couldn't manage really without doing it, but um, What's great is you acquire the data and you can keep reprocessing it. So if you have only a so-so library right now, I mean the FASTA right now, then as something gets better or better annotated, you just um, can research it. Yeah, yeah, totally. And they're reusable, you know, as long as you're working with that organism, you can you can keep using it. So it, it, it seems to, the results look good and it seems to cut down on some of the processing overhead, which is which is what you want, right? You don't want it to be easy and, and not give you good results, but it, it seems like it's doing both, so. And you can combine two uh, ELIB, DLIBs that you have, two ProSIT libraries. You can combine them in Scaffold because you can only use one library at a time. But if you have, for example, two species that are mixed together, then just combine the libraries and do the processing. Excellent. Okay. Well, does anybody have any final comments? Um, yeah, we did have some questions, yeah, we can some Q&A in the chat. I will. Um, I'm not the person that should be answering those. So <laughs> if anybody wants to, if anybody sure. wants to take a stab at any of the, I can answer pretty um software ones, but, <laughs> but not, not the, not the real scientific ones. So if anybody wants to look at those and, and take a stab any on the panel, feel free to do that. Um, yeah. Or if they're well, directed a, at somebody specific. There's a question um, for Dr. Weintraub. How different are the data analyzed with ProSIT libraries versus those analyzed with chromatogram libraries? Okay, so let me be clear that we're using both of them because you, while it's technically feasible to search your, your DIA files directly against um, the ProSIT library, you want to generate your chromatogram library against the ProSIT, and then you search your experimental results against the chromatogram library. Before we had the ProSIT, the best results were using some kind of a spectral library. Now, I will say that people who are working on one cell type or one species and have the time to generate a really deep DDA library, you're going to get the very best results that you can, but that's, that's a huge number of injections and, and analyses. And most of us, and especially in a core environment, we can't do that. So again, the steps are you, get the ProSIT library, you acquire your gas phase fractions, generate what we call the ELIB, the chromatogram library from that search, and then use that ELIB as the reference uh, for your experimental samples. And the way I usually do it is the gas phase fractions will run one block first, then acquire the gas phase fractions, 
and then start acquiring the rest. This is all uh, programmed, of course, in the instrument. And while this is going on, I will generate the chromatogram library uh, while the rest are being acquired and search the first set just to see how everything is. And plus, because I can't wait to see what some of the results are and uh, then process the rest. Yeah, and so you bring up a good point that it's um, it's beneficial for everybody, but it seems like you in a core facility type environment have been able to take advantage of them tremendously because it allows you to not have to build an individual library for every every new, because you're not getting the same thing every time, right? So, so if you need to jump between species, you know, in between samples, it, um, it's just, it allows you to do that a lot more easily than have to, to, to build a, a chromatogram library every single time for, for some, maybe for the, you know, the smaller type experiments that it's just not feasible to do so. So even some related cells, I've been amazed investigators have sent the cells. And when you look at them in DIA, there's clear differences between them or among the different groups. And so it just is not feasible in a, a core laboratory to acquire that many. I think as well, the fact that uh, the, sam the library is made with the client samples and there's no sort of intellectual property conversation regarding the source of the library, or what's going into the library and how the library is made. That's a huge, that's a, eliminates a, a huge piece of work. You know, you don't, one, you don't have to have the conversation about intellectual property related to the library. And two, like Sue said, you don't have to make a good library. It's gonna take a lot of time and it's going to have a cost overhead associated with it, which is probably going to prevent you from running samples that you want to put in your study. And so when you look at this, you know, when you take a step back and you eliminate the overhead with generating the library, the DDA library, and you look at the decreased runtime associated with getting the data, the, the net is just a, you can increase the scale of your experiment and start to pull in all the controls you want to do without running over budget. It's a really cool piece of software. Yeah. Definitely. Lindsay, do you have any comments <clears throat> on the question about fames? As I, I actually, this might be a good one um, for Jacob. I don't know, is ion mobility, like fames ion mobility built into scaffold yet? It's not right now. Um, yeah, on the list, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. It's and it's. I think it's pretty high on the list. Um, at least you know it's certain that it's something that we've certainly talked about, but it's not something that's been implemented yet. But you know, yeah. if if that seems where you know if if we see that people are interested in that, then it's something that we could definitely um, you know yeah. consider adding in the future. I think I think there is a workaround. I think if you use MS Convert, I think there's a way in MS Convert that you can parse out uh, the different CV acquired mm. spectra into separate files and search each of the, I think there's a way to do okay. that. I, I've, I've, I've been myself. exploring mm -hmm. this to see if I want to put fames on a shared instrumentation. Uh, granted, I uh, couldn't be resubmitting, unfortunately. Um, and it, it's, it's something I'm going to have some discussions with people who have <laughs> been trying it. But one possibility is while you can't take advantage of all of the features of FAMES, and I'm saying FAMES specifically as it's on a thermo instrument rather than ion mobility in general, uh, but you can help eliminate the one plus ions going in. So you could set it at a single setting and it might let you dig down deeper without having the one pluses even there. Uh, when I, I've used the different settings for the charge states, I used to use one to four, and I now really stick with two to three because your best data are going to come from two to three, uh, the charge states. So it, 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 I'm, I'm hoping I can get somebody to give it a try uh, so that I can uh, comment on it on a shared instrumentation grant. Yeah, and that's one of the things about when you generate a prosit library, it, it lets you choose what shard states you want to use. So we've we've gone back and forth between making some with one to four and two to three, and it's it's pretty trivial to to do it from one to four and then try it from two to three and see how the results look and everything. So um, so it provides a lot of flexibility. Yeah. And as I said before, I'm really happy to um, meet separately with anyone who would like to look at the data 
in depth or have some discussions of ways that you can use DIA or how you can interpret the results. Okay, well, with that, I think we've gotten through all the questions. So I think we'll go ahead and end our um, second virtual brunch. Um, extra special thanks to Michael and Sue and Lindsay um, um, for for joining us for talking about some science. We had a, a, a we talked about DIA, but a lot of stuff in the DIA space. We talked about you know um, analyzing some data, some new stuff that's coming on. Um, all the presentations were awesome. So again, thank you very much. Um, if you have anybody has any questions, feel free to um, uh, our or, um, proteomsoftware.com. You can um, submit a support request or send us an email. Um, Mike, do they? Ha what's a good way to get up with you if you um, for people that want to reach out to you um, uh, on your you, website or? Yeah, you can go yeah. straight to info at MS Bioworks. A, a quick acknowledgement to you and the folks at Proteom Software because you know with the pandemic, everybody's looking for wins. You know, and we're seeing, like Sue said, people have been working through this, you know, and it's not been an easy time. And you've delivered this product. It's amazing. It's, it's a real highlight. I, I think it's a fantastic job. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's been nice to, um, to you know, at least get together, at least on Zoom and, and talk about a little bit of science. And who knows, maybe ASMS in October will actually happen this year. So there you go. in a couple months, we'll be seeing people face to face, which which would be would be nice, <laughs> but this yeah. has worked out pretty well in the interim. So with that, I'll go ahead and say thank you, everybody. Thank you, the attendees, of course. Um, plenty of ways to get up with us if you have any questions. And um, yeah, thanks for thanks for joining us. Thanks. We'll see everybody soon. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.